Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to do an overview of the radial nerve. We're going to see how the radial nerve branches, and we're going to look at the functions of those branches, whether they're sensory or motor, and then briefly talk about each of the muscles that those branches innervate. So the radial nerve is, of course, one of the terminal branches of the brachial plexus. It comes directly from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus and has root values C5 through T1. So every single root that's a part of the brachial plexus, it has a piece of each of those. The first part of the radial nerve here is the component that exists in the posterior brachium before it reaches the elbow joint. So being in the posterior brachium, the nerve actually travels behind the humerus, and it really travels mostly in the radial groove or the spiral groove of the humerus, as it's often called. And before it gets to the elbow joint, while it's in this compartment, it gives off two major branches. One is a series of branches that goes to all three heads of the triceps brachii muscle, right here, and the second is a motor branch that goes to the ancaneus muscle. And as we know, triceps brachii is the major agonist of elbow extension, but also participates in shoulder extension. And then ancaneus down here in green at the elbow joint really just assists in elbow extension. It assists the triceps, and it also plays a role in stabilizing the elbow joint. Now the radial nerve will continue moving down the brachium, and eventually it'll cross the elbow joint where it winds up in the forearm or the antebrachium. And for the most part, it's on the lateral side of the antebrachium. And here it gives off two more motor branches. These go to the muscles brachioradialis, shown right here on the left, and extensor carpi radialis longus shown here on the right. Recall that brachioradialis participates in both radial deviation, thus its name, and a little bit of elbow flexion, so it's one of the three major elbow flexors. Extensor carpi radialis longus participates in radial deviation, as the name suggests, and also wrist extension, again, as the name suggests. Now, immediately after the radial nerve gives off these two branches to brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus, it's going to bifurcate into two separate branches. This one is the superficial branch, and this one is the deep branch, and they're named superficial radial nerve and deep radial nerve, respectively. So, the superficial branch is purely sensory. You can remember this because superficial starts with an S, and so does sensory. And this nerve travels all the way down to the hand and supplies cutaneous sensory information from the hand. And you can see over here in this figure the regions of the hand that are sensed by the superficial branch of the radial nerve here in this red color. If we look at the palmar aspect of the hand, really the only part that's sensed by the radial nerve is going to be the lateral aspect of the thenar eminence right here on the thumb side. And then on the dorsal aspect of the hand, other than the tips of digits 1, 2, and 3, it's really going to be the lateral half or the thumb half of the dorsal aspect of the hand. The superficial radial nerve has no motor function. Now we also have the deep radial nerve as the other branch. Now the deep radial nerve does not exist for very long because it's going to change names very quickly as we're going to see on the next slide. But before it changes names, the deep radial nerve gives off two more motor branches. Those are to extensor carpi radialis brevis, shown here on the left, and the supinator muscle, shown here on the right. Remember that extensor carpi radialis brevis participates in both radial deviation and wrist extension, really in the same way as extensor carpi radialis longus. And then as this name suggests, the supinator muscle participates in radial ulnar supination. Now take a look at this over here. The deep radial nerve, it gives off these two branches. And really right as it's giving off the branch to supinator, it's actually going to enter into a little tunnel within the supinator muscle. So this muscle right here has a tunnel in it. And the deep radial nerve is going to enter into that tunnel. And that tunnel is aptly named the supinator tunnel. The opening of the supinator tunnel is called the Arcade of Froche. So the Arcade of Froche is just the opening. The entire tunnel is the supinator tunnel. And as soon as the deep radial nerve enters into that Arcade of Froche, into the supinator tunnel, it immediately changes names to posterior interosseous nerve. 
If you look at this figure over here, you can see the radial nerve as it crosses the elbow joint, and you can see that it immediately gives off a couple of branches right here. These two branches are likely to brachia radialis and extensor carpi radialis longus. Then you can see right here where my mouse is, the radial nerve bifurcates. This branch going down here is the superficial branch of the radial nerve. This one was purely sensory and provides sensory information from the hand. This thicker one is the deep branch of the radial nerve. And you can see right here it's entering into a tunnel within the supinator muscle. The opening is the arcade of Froch, and the actual length of the tunnel is the supinator tunnel. And again, when that deep radial nerve crosses through the arcade of Froch, it becomes the posterior interosseous nerve. And even once the nerve exits from the supinator tunnel, it's still the posterior interosseous nerve. But the posterior interosseous nerve is going to play a role in innervating pretty much all other extensors within the forearm. And here they are. So the first two are extensor digitorum and extensor digiti minimi. Extensor digitorum is going to provide extension of digits two through five, not the thumb, at the MCP and interphalangeal joints. Extensor digiti minimi is going to only extend digit five, but it's going to do so at the MCP or metacarpophalangeal joint. The next two muscles are extensor carpi ulnaris and extensor pollicis brevis. Extensor carpi ulnaris participates in both wrist extension and ulnar deviation, as the name suggests. And extensor pollicis brevis is, of course, going to extend the pollux, or the thumb, and it's going to do so at the carpal metacarpal and metacarpal phalangeal joints. The last three muscles are extensor pollicis longus, abductor pollicis longus, and extensor indicus. Extensor pollicis longus is going to extend the thumb at the metacarpophalangeal and interphalangeal joints. Abductor pollicis longus is going to abduct and extend the thumb at the carpal metacarpal joint. And based on where this muscle actually originates and inserts, it's actually also going to be able to participate a little bit in wrist extension. And then extensor indicus is going to only extend the second digit. Um, and again, this one's going to participate slightly in wrist extension. Hopefully this video gave you a good overview of the radial nerve and its branches and what the functions of those branches are. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.